thanks for coming to this talk this afternoon. Um, I would like to introduce the, ourselves. This is the SIG Architecture Kubernetes intro and update talk. Um, so, like, I did want to ask you all, like, what do you think this talk is about? <laughs> uh, anyone have an idea what this talk is about? <laughs> Good. <laughs> not in the traditional sense as such. Uh, we are not going to talk about deep into the internals of Kubernetes, but we'll talk about like how we take architectural decisions, how the company uh, community operates, um, how we go about uh, doing the different things, uh, you know, which might not be very specific to one area uh, or one um, special interest group in the community and things like that. Uh, you know, this is an intro and an update. So we do uh, this kind of talk to welcome all of you into the community to take part in the processes that we have uh, and help uh, you know, make Kubernetes better for everyone going forward. So we'll talk about like uh, what, how, how do you make enhancements in the community? How do you add new features? How do you make sure that the old features, you know, like just installing Kubernetes is not the end of the story, right? Like you have to have a, you know, upgrade, maintenance, everything comes into the picture and then it becomes really hard, like just like any other software that, that we have. So SIG architecture is a place where we talk about these things and uh, work on practical uh, solutions uh, around how to make sure that uh, we don't break people uh, and how to make sure that uh, people are getting the things that they need from Kubernetes. Uh, hope that helps. Uh, just warning you ahead of time. <laughs> so uh, my nickname is Dims. Uh, you can call me Dims. I'm on GitHub, Twitter. It's uh, same Dims everywhere. Uh, John? Yeah, I'm, I'm John, uh, and uh, Dims and I are two-thirds of the, uh, the SIG architecture uh, co-chairs. Yeah, um, John is from Google. I work for AWS currently. Um, so if, let, let's take a quick look at the goals of the Kubernetes project itself, right? Like you've seen this before. You've seen how Kubernetes is being used by everybody, everywhere. Uh, people have called it, you know, the. Uh, I think Priyanka called it as a Linux moment of Kubernetes in one of her keynotes. Uh, we try to be very flexible, extensible, automatable. Um, we have some new ideas around like, um, you know, how exactly people need to uh, do their APIs and how, uh, you know, declarative patterns and things like that are new, how to use AAML for all the things. Uh, so. You've seen all those things, and that's why you are here in this conference, um, and you want to uh, use Kubernetes, and you, you see the value in, the, in Kubernetes. Uh, and this is, these are all the things that we think about while we go about on our um, you know, tasks during the uh, release cycle. So we do have a few community values um, that we adhere to. Um, you know, if you look at the small URL at the bottom of, you have the direct link to uh, what our values are, but, you know, summarizing, uh, we want to be sure that this works for everybody, right? Uh, if it just works for Google and AWS, it's not enough. It has to work for everybody in this room. Um, you know, we try to do as much automation as possible. We, uh, not just for the community to work, but also making sure that you all can do your own automation um, you know, in an easy fashion as well. Uh, we want to be more inclusive, uh, so we try really hard to listen to multiple voices. I will give you a call out to at the end about you know some of the things that we are uh, looking for feedback from you all to make the uh, you know our forward uh, looking uh, things like, for example, there was a talk today on uh, uh, there was a keynote today on the, uh, working group for LTS. Where does that happen? That happens here. Um, so and there's a survey in the morning. There was a call out for that. So we'll talk about that a little bit again on today. Uh, and we want to keep evolving. 
um, if we stagnate uh, and if we uh, then there isn't much fun for in, in it for anybody right like so uh, kubernetes has to evolve and it has to keep up with the times just for you know think about this week right like what are the new things that people are asking from kubernetes ml and ai are new things that were not as much you know the year ago or two years ago but now people do want to run ml and ai workloads on kubernetes so then we have to figure out like how do we translate that to actual things that we need to do as part of our, of our community work right so um we have to keep evolving, basically. That, that's the point we are trying to make. Um, so it's important to understand the structure of how we work, how we do work in the community. So uh, I mentioned briefly about special interest groups. Special interest groups are essentially, you know, you, you can think of like domain experts, like networking, storage, uh, you know, uh, security, uh, scalability, Windows, uh, authentication, CLI, right? Those are all like areas where people know what they're doing, like the SIG CLI is writing a CLI, right? Authentication folks are working on authentication and authorization, right? The networking folks are deep into the weeds on how uh, uh, things need to work um, for all the network use cases that you have. But then how do you tie all of these together? That's where uh, SIG ar architecture comes in. So if you look from the top, uh, CNCF is the foundation we live in. Uh, in under CNCF, uh, there is the Kubernetes project. Kubernetes project is run by the Kubernetes steering committee. Uh, the Kubernetes steering committee essentially delegates the responsibilities and the roles to different special interest groups. Now, for the technical things, they have delegated that to SIG architecture. So essentially, uh, they are telling SIG architecture that, hey, you are responsible for making sure that all the SIGs are working well with each other. And if there are conflicts between multiple SIGs on something, then uh, you have to step in and help uh, moderate uh, and come to a conclusion and things like that. So uh, we have a charter for the SIG architecture. And that is a charter that uh, the Kubernetes steering committee has approved which gives us the authority over things that we do in the project. Uh, does that help or is that, you know, is that logical? Does that make sense? Okay. So it, it, this is important for you all to know also because if you want to do some work in the community, then you need to figure out like, oh, do I, what kind of a role I'm looking for? What kind of an area is of interest to me? then it helps you navigate to figure out like, a, yeah, I think I'll go spend some time in network or storage or, uh, you know, runtime, uh, you know, uh, node, uh, things like that. Okay. So, uh, like I said, we, we have a charter and our charter has these things listed. So I'll let you read it briefly um, and digest it a little bit and I'll walk you through a few of the things that are here. Now, Okay, so let's take the first thing. Uh, it says conformance test, test de definitions. What does it mean, right? So all of you want to use Kubernetes. All of you have different vendors or you are rolling your own Kubernetes. How do you make sure that two clusters of Kubernetes, maybe from one, one vendor to another vendor or a managed cloud provider or uh, you know, self-deployed um, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, you know, you could be using cubes, uh, mini cube. You can be using COPS. You can be using you know something else, K3s, uh, K0s. How do you make sure that your applications still work on all of them? Right? You see the problem there? Because if everybody starts making their own changes, then your applications are not going to work. So. The way we enforce that is using conformance tests. So in conformance tests, what we end up doing is, here is the API for Kubernetes. Um, here are the 
things that must work exactly the way we have defined it across everyone, right? So those are the conformance tests that we write, which we then use a conformance program where all the vendors, if they want to use Kubernetes in their name, for example, I'm from AWS. Uh, so the AWS Kubernetes managed service is called EKS. Uh, and same thing for Google, there is a GKE. So if either one of us wants to use Kubernetes in the name, we have to pass the conformance test. And we have to publish the results publicly, and that must be replicatable by other people. So that is the bar for using Kubernetes in your name and in your product so that any customer can be sure that the Kubernetes that you get is something that you expect. Does not make sense? Okay. Uh, so similar to that, uh, we help out with design principles, deprecation policy, um, and lately we've been spending a lot more time on production readiness review, uh, which uh, John will talk about in a little bit. And I did hint about how do you make enhancements? We do have an enhancements process, right? Like, so uh, it's not enough to just throw code over the wall, right? Um, say you're interested in something. You're working, uh, you have like a 10X programmer who can like write a bunch of code and like, okay, the new feature, we want this in our product. You know, guy goes right and throws out on the wall. What do you do with it? We don't know what to do with it. We don't know you from anybody else, right? Uh, how, who, what's gonna happen if there is a bug in the code that you gave us, right? So we have to know deep into the details of like, why are you doing this? How are you doing this? Uh, what kind of uh, things did you think about? Uh, is this the only proposal? Is there any alternating proposal? Um, you know, how, what is the effect of this uh, uh, new feature in production? Uh, how do you track logs, metrics, uh, all those other things that you need for your production clusters? We ask those questions to the people who are working with us. So that is part of the get process. So um, we talked briefly about uh, some of these things. Um, test review and management is under um, the purview of SIG architecture. We have Jordan here who helps with uh, API reviews. Um, API reviews are very important for us because imagine um, you know, the APIs keep changing and they break. Like you code to an API and then uh, the API is changed uh, under your feet and then uh, you, you are, uh, the, the thing that you wrote is, is not gonna work, right? So there is a natural progression on how to evolve the APIs that we have over a period of time. And from our experience, we have written down how exactly you need to think about this. Uh, I'll give you a simple example, right? Um, imagine uh, right at the beginning, Kubernetes had only one IP address for a pod, right? And then uh, they wanted two IP addresses or an IPv6, right? Like, so the API change. So the CLI changes, the API changes, and how do you make sure that the evolution of the APIs are backward compatible and uh, you know, forward proof? Those kinds of things we end up uh, doing in the API review process. Um, we talked about the caps. So this is a process where it's a living document. We write it down. We keep updating it as we go through the uh, different uh, stages. Uh, there is a process of alpha, beta, and GA that we go through to make sure that um, you know existing code is not broken. So we add feature flags and things like that. We make sure that when we are deprecating things, like one of the things that um, you might have heard um, in the last year or so is like, hey, in 1.24, we deprecated Docker, uh, uh, removed Docker shim. So you can't use Docker shim anymore. So that was, okay, I see one person smiling. So we literally plastered that information across every channel that we have, right? Like whether it is a Slack channel or a website or you know, uh, anywhere you go, you would not miss that uh, fact that we are deprecating. 
We don't do that for everything, <laughs> right? But that was an extreme case where we had to do it uh, because we know that it would affect people who are upgrading from um, older versions and uh, we wanted to make sure that they see it before uh, they have to, and they can plan for it ahead of time. So deprecation process is very important. Uh, version skew is very important because you have to upgrade and say if the upgrade didn't work, then you, you should have some choices around what exactly you can downgrade or like during the upgrade process, if you have a lot of components, then you know how you might not be able to do all of them at the same time. So like, what is the skew that will work um, between components uh, in, in a version range, right? So what kind of debates we, we will end up having in SIG architecture? So when there are technical leads and chairs um, and owners of different areas, when they have disagreements uh, and they're not sure, um, there might be trade-offs, um, we end up moderating those discussions and making sure that we are taking the right decisions. And then we refer back to our values, refer back to our charter and figure out like, okay, uh, let's do, we have to, at, in the end of the day, we have to pick a way to do something. You know, there is gonna be consequences. How much consequences, who pays the price, what do we need to do, when do we need to do, how much comms do we need to put out, all those things we end up uh, talking about in SIG architecture. Uh, we have a mailing list for sure. Um, we do write, try to write a lot of these things down and we, start, we you know, when in doubt, <laughs> we write a policy about something or the other, right? But then not everything is written down. Um, things keep changing in the world, right? Like uh, a while ago, we didn't have a policy around like when do we update Golang versions or do we go around changing the Golang versions in older versions of uh, the releases that we make? So we started writing one because it started bothering us more, uh, especially with the CVs that are coming out in Golang and elsewhere. We are like, okay, fine, we, this, we need to do this. And uh, we ended up writing, writing those things down. Uh, one, one of these days, people will come and say, hey, I have this exciting new architecture. Uh, can, can I add this to Kubernetes? Right, like I mean, we are like, yeah, you're welcome, but here are the steps. Like, you know, you have to start here and make sure it, it builds fine, and then you have to go through these set of tests, and you have to go through those test set of tests. Then we might be think about like making a release where um, your architecture is supported, right? Like, or Illumos, right? Uh, or different operating systems that we don't currently support, uh, and we did have to. Uh, make a call on saying, okay, Windows with ARM, not ARM, the ARM32, sorry, we're not doing that anymore. So we have to make those kinds of decisions because keeping these things up is hard too, right? Like if you don't have a CI, what is the point in supporting an architecture or an operating system? So that's a call that we need to make. So that is the kind of uh, decisions and discussions that happen in SIG architecture. Okay. Um, do you want to take over from yeah, here? I can yeah, over, yeah. yeah. So, so to get all of this done, generally the, the structure within Kubernetes project overall is you have the SIGs, but then you have underneath the SIGs, you have sub projects that are sort of narrower scope. So within SIG architecture, to get all of each of these things that Dims has been talking about falls into a different, a different sub project as you see here. So uh, some of these he's covered pretty well already, but I think we'll, we'll drill into to a few of them as we, as we go. Um, API review, Dim's mentioned. This is all of this comes down to what are the processes we use to control the flow of features into Kubernetes? Because you know, Kubernetes, every feature adds risk, every feature adds capability, and we need to manage the risk and capability trade-off. So, API review is about consistency among the APIs. So, when you go to a storage API versus a network API versus a compute API. Um, they have the same flavor, right, and, and how those are maintained. We would love to get, if you're interested in this area, you know, get involved, jump into this sub-project. Um, it's a really, actually, this is one of the coolest things you can do in Kubernetes. It does take quite a bit of depth and understanding of, of the system um, and of Go, but it's, uh, 
it's kind of like a, 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 maybe a pinnacle of, of, of achievement for people in the community to get to API review because you end up doing a lot of design review on new, new features as well. Uh, the other sub-project, or another sub-project is code organization. So here you're thinking about the dependencies and dependency management, um, things like when Go is, is upgraded, but also things like, you know, we have hundreds of dependencies. How do you manage those as, they, as they're, uh, um, how do we reduce the dependencies as much as possible, and how do you manage them as they, as they change? Um, enhancements process. This is the overall organizational process to control that feature flow. Um, so some contributors kind of you know, hate us to some extent for it, but the reality is that without a controlled enhancements process, everything would go to hell pretty fast. Excuse my language. But um, so we, uh, we, we, we control things in the way that Dims was talking about earlier. Um, conformance testing, another sub-project. So all of these things are done. But basically what happened is that Kubernetes, as it grew, uh, conformance came in a little bit later. And of course, that meant there was a bunch of technical debt. There was a bunch of missing conformance tests. So over the last uh, several years, uh, the CNCF has been kind of uh, funding a group of engineers, actually, to build out the conformance test suite. And we are at like 99.6% coverage or something, almost there, of the GA APIs. So if we've got folks from II here, thank you very much. It's been awesome. Um, and we're, we're super close. Uh, but that's really critical for that user workload portability, uh, which is, of course, key to Kubernetes story. A uh, little more on production readiness review. So this is another part of that feature flow process. So we have how many, how many, how many contributors? 10,000, 15,000, like an enormous number of contributors. One of the, you know, and, and everybody's got ideas. So we have to have processes to get that flow. But not only that, as you mature those ideas, you know, when they first come in, you come in with this crazy idea, we need you to come into it at an alpha state. And, and so what does alpha mean? Well, production readiness reviews kind of help define what the real hard constraints are and what the real hard constraints of each of these stages means. Pretty much in alpha, what we look for in production readiness review is you can turn it off or on with a feature gate. If you turn it on, you use it, and then you turn it off again, you'll be okay. And then if you turn it on yet again, you'll still be okay. Because there are lots of times when, you know, you know, maybe you, you upgrade and then you turn it on again and all of a sudden it's broken and it causes some, some cataclysm. So that's kind of the goal at alpha. At beta, it ramps up where we want metrics. You can see people can actually monitor it. They can tell that it's working the way it's expected. And of course, at, at GA, it's, it's even further. So this is a process by, where, by which each, pers each cap, each enhancement proposal is reviewed um, at design time and to ensure that people are thinking through these sorts of questions. Basically, the point of view is, I have to run 50,000 clusters. How can I tell whether something is working or not? Um, all right, we have 10 minutes left and we wanna have time for questions. Um, another big area of focus for SIG architecture is, uh, helping to guide and define. I mean, really, it's the other SIG. SIG architecture itself doesn't actually write a lot of code or own a lot of code. Um, but what we do is help with the other SIGs and help coordinate them and guide them in how to, what principles we should use for, for uh, extensibility within Kubernetes. So uh, that's part of that overall design, um, design principles concept. So over the last several years, there's been a big focus on doing less in tree upstream, meaning as part of core Kubernetes, and doing more using these extension points that, that the community has built. And, uh, and so, you have yeah. a comment on uh, that? This is a key thing that we do, because if you look at the CNCF landscape, um, and you can see so many projects, guess what? All of them have some sort of story with Kubernetes. Uh, they extend Kubernetes in some ways. They, you know, and they have a Kubernetes story. They live within Kubernetes or run on top of Kubernetes. Like, you know, they use all the extension mechanisms that we use, and that is because that is how we design Kubernetes. Right. Yeah. 
we, you can read this uh, lots and lots of different ways to extend Kubernetes, and you're probably familiar with many, many of them. Um, so where is Kubernetes going in the future? I think that you know, we're going to continue with extension points. As we know, we've already built out most of conformance, and now there's a policy where you don't go to GA unless you have conformance tests. So we maintain conformance. And, and I think something that's not on here is a, you know, what Dims mentioned earlier is work with rela relation to AI ML workloads. I, did, I thought you said it was something on LTS. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh. You participate, you know, come oh, to the okay. meetings. Uh, we are easy to find. Uh, join Kubernetes Slack, and, uh, you know, we have channels out there. Uh, we really want your opinion. We want your use cases. We want your pain points. Uh, we want what you wish for from Kubernetes, for sure. And one call out that we definitely have for you today, right now, if you can do, is tell us where you are in your journey of Kubernetes. Um, what sorts of uh, Kubernetes clusters that you're running right now, and uh, you know what kind of pain points that you've seen when you are upgrading Kubernetes, uh, and uh, tell us. Like right now, we have a policy. Our policy is like any uh, release will be supported by the community for a year, right? And if you are if you have clusters that are older than a year, then you know you are out of options, uh, at least from us. And then you depend on your vendor or uh, you depend on somebody else especially with all the security stuff com coming down the pipe, uh, and you've seen all those vulnerabilities, and like every, uh, every week there is something new which is scary, and uh, so don't run <laughs> clusters with unsupported Kubernetes. You should update to new ones, and you tell us what kind of pain points that you're seeing when you're doing that, and please uh, go through the survey and tell us, uh, so we are collecting the information, so that then we can figure out like how can we support you, um, you know, in one way or another. Uh, we can't promise exactly what we'll do, but uh, the data that we collect from you is going to be helpful in a lot of decisions that, that we are going to make. And the better data we have, the more data we have, uh, the better decisions we'll be able to make. Yeah. So exactly. So this is this is your easiest opportunity to influence the the long-term support. Uh, initiative within Kubernetes. Of course, you are, it is an open source community and it is a very open, friendly community. And so if you have a lot of concern in this area, please join uh, the working group. Jordan over there in the back, Jordan here. Yeah. Uh, he's a good person to talk to about that if, you're, if you want to. Um, but uh, uh, that's one of the major initiatives going on. So I, that's what we have, but we have six minutes. Yeah. For yeah. questions, like if you have, like, what did what bothered you about Kubernetes? Like, if you have a Kubernetes story, Kubernetes failure story, go ahead, please. Yeah, I have a question about. Yeah, can you use the microphone? Yeah, yeah there yes. is a walk-in mic. You can queue up too. Uh, if you have an additional question, you can join. Check check. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about security. So, like, practically nowhere throughout the presentation there was like much about security. So, is it something you actively think about as yes. an architecture group? Yes. So, uh, we do have a Kubernetes security response committee. So, uh, and they do the pre-embargo and those kinds of things. We have uh, a vulnerability disclosure process. We've written uh, things down saying like when you see something that you think it's a security issue, here are the steps that you go through and report things to us, and we have a program where we have a set of uh, folks that who look at the incoming queue, and they talk to different vendors, different people, different people doing security, and then figure out what is a plan on how to address this, uh, come up with an embargo date, uh, come up with a set of patches, we do this all the time. We we are really good at this right now um, in the CVE process. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was actually talking not about vulnerabilities per se, but more about like the general architecture. Like yeah. we have network policies, yeah. so, but to do that, you need absolutely. Calico. So we we've we've done several of those things in the past. We have a SIG security, which helps with these things. 
we have a security audit that uh, CNCF pays for every year. Um, so we go. Uh, so we are expanding slowly what it covers, um, and uh, you know, every year we find less and less of things that. Uh, you know, that we need to fix. Yeah. So yes, it is a constant ongoing process. Uh, we have a SIG auth and we have a SIG security and we have the Kubernetes response committee. We have the audit. So believe me, between all the vendors poking at things plus all the community infrastructure that we have, um, it, you know, I, have, I can say in good faith that we are trying to be extremely careful about how we, what we are giving you so that your stuff is better off. Yeah, I, I think the way I would put it is, is the people that tend to be involved in SIG architecture have been around a while and so have a, a viewpoint that will take security into consideration, yep. but the, the, the sort of hard details of that fall into the other SIGs. So you've got SIG security, which is really the security expertise, but you've got SIG auth, which is going to have things around the, you know, the authentication and authorization. Yep. And then you've got, um, you know, even within like say SIG node, right? You, you, there's so many layers to security. Yep. Right? It's, it doesn't fall just at the architecture layer, but you've got, you know, privilege mode on the pods versus not, right? That, those sort of things fall into, uh, into to, to the individual right. SIGs. Like right now, that. we are running CTFs somewhere in uh, this conference center. Um, What's a CTF? CTF, capture the flag. Oh. Uh, so essentially, they'll give you a set of instructions for you to go in, look into a cluster, and you have to go find things, uh, you know, break into things and find things, and, um, and then basically we close the loopholes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, any Kubernetes failure stories? We love those. Uh, I don't know if you heard the story from Datadog this morning in the, in the keynote. Um, yeah, I see one nod at least on that side. That was a very interesting one. Uh, it, it was about unattended upgrades bringing down uh, their entire production system. Uh, it didn't have anything to do with Kubernetes per se, but it was a really good story nevertheless. Um, so, uh, you know, we are constantly in looking look out for like, how are you using Kubernetes? What are you using it for? What are the pain points that you're seeing and facing? And like, that's how we learn, right? And if we learn, then we can apply to the next set of things that we ship. So uh, that's why we need uh, your help. Okay? All right. Thank Thanks you a lot, much. everyone.